in the early 80s, uh, a gospel group out of Detroit jumped into the scene with a bang, commissioned Change the Face of Gospel Music Forever. Now, joining me is one of its original members, is Mr. Carl Reed. Good afternoon, good morning, at wherever good you are. It's, it's morning somewhere. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be on with you, sir. Thank uh, you. The Giant Killer. Come on, come on now. God bless you, man of God. <laughs> bless you. Thank you. Thank you for, for being with us. Now, um, this is a, a real interesting period for everybody. And first of all, I'm going to ask, how have you been during this lockdown? Well, um, the United States is pretty large. And we have uh, urban cities. And then we have, man, it's so spread out. Um, a lot of the urban cities are going through what we call this pandemic and now we have a double pandemic with the looting, looting and the rioting um, because people are upset and then uh, uh, there are some people who are removed from it and then there are some people who are right in the middle of it you know um, we're doing pretty good I mean uh, God has blessed us to be uh, uh, really far from the urban city and so we hear about stuff and, and sometimes that can be a problem because we only hear what the news says we, we don't have really an idea well what's really happening downtown so they could tell us it's bad or they could tell us it's good and we have to go by what they say but um based upon social media man it's, it's pretty bad in certain places um and but it's the the problem is it's, it's not touching and i think generating the desired uh, uh, uh places that it should touch you know it needs to start at the top down and I don't think it'll it'll get better until um, some of these things calm down. But uh, but the real answer to your question is we're blessed. We're doing good. God has blessed us to be where we are, and so we're just but praying and believing God that things are going to calm down here in the next couple of days, so we can get to the fix it part of it because we need to fix this. And I believe we will be able to fix it. We just need time for people to calm down, and let's get to the the true nature of what this is about because if we don't fix the, the, the real problem this is something that'll come up again um in a few more years and so we're just we're just praying that we can get to the true nature of this thing and get it fixed um i mean what is what is the mood of of the people there uh, in the u.s the mood of the people is is we have you know i don't know if you've ever seen this uh this picture it's a picture of uh uh uh, three primates. <laughs> Some people who yeah. are watching the see, yeah. hear no evil, see no evil, do no evil. Mm -hmm. Well, we have people who are out here that, that are unaffected by it all. Uh, and that is, they live so far away from it, they only hear about it. And and the response is, oh, that's bad. And then they go back to regular life. And then, then you have those who are down there who are being pushed to do evil by a force and because of their angst they join in and they start to participate and uh i'm we're here in detroit detroit suffered uh this 1967 riots that really destroyed and it changed the face of detroit forever so we know what happens when you have rioting looting stuff like that and so thankfully Detroit has not had any major damage. We've had protests, but our police chief lived through it when he was a child, and he's like, we know how to handle it. So there's protests, but there's no rioting and looting, and they're basically protecting downtown. So we've been there, so we understand how to go through it. So uh, Detroit is different than a lot of the other major cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, especially New York, Philadelphia, places like that. So... Um, we just have to, we're going to have to wade through this one over the next couple of days or maybe a week. I hope not that long. And uh, I think we'll start seeing the uh, the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train. <laughs> so that's where we are, basically. So someone in uh, like you who's, who's um, I mean, you've been around in the industry for, for you know, since 82, I believe. Um, so you're considered a general in this uh in the industry what would your advice be to a young person right now who's angry um 
Well, wow, that's, that's, there's so much that goes into that. Um, and it's, it will be really hard to answer it in one, in, in one take. I think the biggest problem that we have in um, the United States and especially in the black community is fatherlessness. Um, I remember in 1967 when my dad was driving us to Sunday school and I'm looking over the back seat and I'm seeing uh, military. I'm seeing uh, tanks and I'm seeing military vehicles and soldiers standing with M1 rifles. I'm like, Dad, what's going on? And this is a seven year, this is a seven year old or a six year old boy. And he's like, Well, son, the National Guard is here because of the riot, yada, yada, yada. Right. And so I, the, the difference I, I see is, is that I had a father who cared and I knew he cared about me because he made sure that we had everything we needed. He corrected me with love and um, he didn't abandon us and he taught us life lessons, uh, things that I, can, I do continuously even until this day. And so I think the biggest thing I would take to a young person is, is first of all, let's find out why you're mad, why you're upset. Let's, let's identify that. And see, once we identify that, then we can start to talk you through it and get some healing. Because when a person, these young, these young people are upset, there's no logic but rampage and rage. So we need mentors. We need young people to listen. And then we need the colleges, universities. We need the schools to teach that things are going to get better. You don't have to fight against the government. If you are, you talk to someone who's lived through it. You know, my dad lived through the Great Depression in, in uh, 1928. And uh, I asked him a question before he passed away years ago. He, my dad passed away in 2002. But in the 90s, I said, Dad, what did you guys do in the Depression? Because, you know, we see images of pictures of people standing in soup lines. You know, the Three Stooges would do shows where they'd have cardboard in their shoes, the big holes. And I said, what do you guys do? The soup lines and this. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, the depression, the Great Depression, what did you guys do? He said, I said, how did you get food? You know, he said, what? He said, we lived on the farm. He said, we went to the smokehouse and got meat. We had canned food from the previous year. And he said, the only thing we had to go to the store for was maybe some spices, <laughs> stuff like that. We had cows, we had pigs, we had chickens. And all other kinds of things. So we had food. That's what we did. And so one of the lessons I take from that is, is someone has to guide young people to be self-sufficient in life. Because if you ever put yourself in a position to where you have to depend on other people, they can control you, manipulate you. And before you know it, you end up in a place in life that you shouldn't be, nor did you want to be in. So I, I don't believe in codependency for for our, for people. Teach people to be independent. Teach people to work hard. Have a work hard work ethic. And there's you know, you know God has a way of rewarding people who work hard, love God, love people, and put family first. Because everything that we do in this uh, the world is based on family. God instituted family you know, a man and a woman and family. And this is what has been working since the time of creation, you know, and everything in, in nature follows the same pattern of male and a female have offspring and male and female. And it, and it keeps going. It's a cycle. And we understand what happens in society when these things are in place. So you might have to work hard. You know, my dad taught me real young that you have to work hard. If you want something, you have to work hard, save your money, and then buy it. And uh, I think this, this media has put forth the idea that you're supposed to have stuff now. Mm. You don't have to work for it. When that's not the Doctors study for years to become a doctor, and they live a doctor's lifestyle. Anything in this life and anything you want in life, you can accomplish it in life. You just have to make sure you focus, work hard. And, 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 and God has a way of opening doors when you work hard and work towards your goal. So that's what I will say to young people. Stop being upset 
and start working hard. And then maybe somebody needs to show them how to work hard because a lot of folks don't have the work, work ethic to, to work hard. And that's what commission did. We worked hard for, we were set up in school to do music, but mm. we worked from 1980 up until 1985 until we got an album out because people didn't want to listen. To, you know, we had the lights cut out on us. We were, on, we were last on the show. <laughs> we were uninvited. I mean, nobody wanted to hear I'm going home. Nobody wanted to hear giving my problems to you or go tell somebody. But we just kept, we kept working at it because we knew that if we can't continue to work at it, keep the work ethic the way it was supposed to go, that one day it's like a floodgate would open and you would able, you'll be able to move about in the industry the way it's intended to be. So it was hard work and perseverance. That was very powerful. Um, my next question is where, what should the church be doing about this situation? Wow. Um, I believe that the church used to be in a position, especially in America, where we could speak to our people culturally and they would follow. But um, ever since Dr. King was assassinated in 68, the church has been under constant attack from the media of uh, the church has too much power, uh, the preachers have too much power, and then it went into all this stuff where, you know, what's the difference between the, uh, the pimp and the preacher? They drive nice cars, and if you dig deeper, they got, they got all the women, and they're doing whatever, they're living good, and the, and the congregants are not living good. And so, one of the things I understand is that the church should be speaking to how to raise the people up. You know, God, family, then country. If, if, if we are going to use the word of God as the manual for life, it can't just be for Sunday, mm. but it has to be something that is put into practice, right? Um, I, I notice athletes work throughout the summer to get in shape for the season. And based upon the hard work they put in, you know, the season usually goes a certain way. Well, it's the same thing with life. Life is something you got to work at. Churches need to speak to let's have solutions, calm solutions. One of my, one of my biggest pet peeves is this. Um, a lot of times we put people in position of leadership that are not tested, that are not proven. And, you know, one of the, one of the crazy things, you get a car repair and, and, the, and the, the, the part that they replace is defective also. Mm. and you're going to have a breakdown as soon as you leave. When you get out on the highway, it's going to break down because it was a defective part put in there. And I think that um, one, we, we got to find a way to stop putting defective people in places of leadership in the church mm. and be, because we don't have a singular message. There's in the, in, the, in the city of Detroit alone, we had over 2,000 churches that were registered churches. And almost every one of them are different denominations. They don't fellowship. They don't have the same message. And so how, how in the world can we speak as one when we don't preach the same, we don't believe the same? This one's upset because this guy has 2,000 members. He has 10. You know, there's so much that we could change, but we're not one. And, and before Christ left, he, he, he told the disciples, he said, my prayer is that you guys will be one and that you guys will show love one to another. He says, and this is how you, this is how the world will know that you guys are my disciples, that you have love one to another. And I think the biggest thing is, is that if we're going to be the examples, so we're going to be the city, city set on the hill, we're going to be the salt. We have to have one message and we're going to have to teach that message. The church is divided and it's divided from different places. I mean, people in the UK believe different things. Australia's got different things. And it's hard to come together if my core belief is different from another person's core belief. So I think uh, that's not what Christ meant for us to have different beliefs 
um, we're going to have to have, the, the church is going to have to get on the same page um, when it comes to the public. I'm, I'm not a firm believer of some of the things that churches do. It's always televised because there are some things that we do is strange in church. Mm. And people say, man, those people are crazy. Well, in, in closed door settings, no, we're not crazy. But when you see it and you've never seen it before, it's crazy. I mean, come on, who, who believes in washing feet or taking communion with, with little wafers? And, and, and who believes in going down to the altar and crying out to God, falling down on your knees? You know, it's like someone said, um, well, how are you going to believe in something you don't see? Well, you, do you believe in the coronavirus? Uh, you, you've never seen the coronavirus, so, but you see the effects of mm -hmm. the coronavirus. And so the church is the great belief. And we see the effects of what the Holy Spirit does in the church. You don't necessarily see the Holy Spirit, but you see the effects of it. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to, what we, what we need to do is, is to be effective in how we present Christ to the rest of the world and once we do that, I think going to, that's going to be a change. So the message has to be singular. The, the message has to be biblically based. It can't be one-sided. You know, we can't, you can't have churches over here who believe in abortion. Then you have churches over here who don't believe in abortion. Mm. Then you have people over here who say, well, that's just a separation of church and state. You know, and I'm thinking, eh, but the word of God is still the same. And we, we go with the word of God. And so we have to have something that we go by. When I do counseling at church and when I do counseling, I do marriage counseling. One of the things I, I, I have to find out is how to get through to the persons. And everybody has to have accountability in their life. You find me a man who's not accountable to anybody. He's, he's, he's a maverick. You know, can't be tamed. Mm. Everybody has to be accountable. Christ was accountable to God. And so man has to be accountable to Christ and the wife has to be accountable to her husband. And so there's an order. Mm. And uh, sometimes people don't like God because they don't like order because God <laughs> is a God of order. Everything has order. You buy a car, there's a manual. Is that, there's order in the manual. It'll tell you how to do things and it'll survive longer. It'll work better tell you how to solve problems. And so accountability is someone who, uh, like my sons, I have two sons. One is, is about to move to California and the other one's, he's going through medical school. But they have to go through the discipline of those genres to be able to get the prize. But there's a disciplining that takes place before they get there because an undisciplined child can't go through that process. You can't, get past this discipline and go past to, to that discipline. No, it has to start early. And so going back to what I said earlier, the church has to have preachers and congregants that they mentor to be, listen, you're under subjection. You know, you ever heard of a submission, <laughs> like a submarine under, yeah. Yeah. there has to be more submission. There has to be a higher authority and there have to be people to say, I don't want to be, I don't want to be right but I want to do what's right, you know? And if you say, if you say that to yourself, I want to be, I, I want to be right the way God wants me to be, then I think it's a start. So the church is going to have to start preaching um, unity. And what do we unify? We unify with the Bible. That's how you unify. This is, this is the last word. The Bible says, love your enemy. Okay, love your enemy. But you know what he did? Yeah, but, you know, it says love your enemies. No, it's hard to do, but it's hard to do outside of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because when a person receives this Holy Spirit, one of those nine manifestations is love, the agape. God gives you the ability to love the unlovable, right? So you can't say you don't have the ability. No, you're just not using that ability. So that's what I would say to the churches. The churches have to be example of love the kind of love that Christ would exemplify to the world today. Um, is, is there any, um, at this time, have, have there been any scriptures or songs that, that, have, um, that you've managed to cling to? And do you think, mm, that, that song really resonates with me for this period of time or season? 
Um, you know, uh, I do some, I do posting on my social media. And then the last song I put up was a song that we did on the first album. Uh, the name of the song is called Surely We Need Him. And uh, it's, if you listen to the words, it sounds like it was written during this pandemic and the rioting and looting. Um, it's on the Pink album. Uh, the I'm Going On album is called Surely We Need Him. Because it talks about all the stuff that's going on now. And the solution is we need God. So, and it asks the question, do, do we need, yeah, surely we need him. We need him in this. We need him in this. And, and I think that um, listening to songs that tell you uh, solutions, one of the things a very, a very prolific writer said a long time ago, that if you talk about a problem, you're now obligated to give the solution because everybody can talk about the problem. A lot of folks, you know, can point the problem out, but not a whole lot of people can tell you what the solution is. And we need solutions now. And so if you're going to talk about the problem, make sure you have the solution to the problem. And that's one of the things that, that, that we have tried to do in commission. We'll talk about a problem, mm. but we'll have to give a solution to the problem. And I think that songs that give you solutions to trouble, songs that give you solutions to questions you have, and um, some, of our, some of our greatest writing came from uh, stuff that we went through, things that we experienced. If you experience pain in a certain level, man, you can, you can turn that pain into a song that can relate to other people. But you got to give a solution because people are looking for solutions. Some of the richest people in the world, they found ways to solve problems. And they, they, they just solve problems. And now they are multi-millionaires and billionaires because they found a problem, found a solution, and now they're successful. Now, um, obviously, you're from the uh, multi-award winning group commissioned. Um, how did you guys get together? I, I believe it's 1982. Um, <laughs> was it, uh, uh, you know what? Yeah, we came, we came together. Actually, our first meeting um, we met in 1980, late 1980, and uh, um, myself and, and Keith Staten, we, we had a group at our local church, and I knew Mitchell from, from high school, and I knew him from church, and Mitchell knew Fred from high school and church. We went to the same high school, Mumford High, and myself, Keith, and Mitchell, we were singing in a group called The Sounds of Joy, and when we... Um, brought Mitchell in, the first thing Mitchell said was, man, I can't wait to Fred get in here. And so <laughs> when he told Fred about us, I said, okay. Because at the time, Fred was playing with the Winans. He was playing bass with the Winans in uh, 1980. And there was also another group called The Unit that was Michael Brooks, Michael Williams, Michael Wright, and Fred. They were just instrumental. They played for weddings, and they would play for uh, other groups and stuff like that. And so we came together. And our first, our first ever meeting was in 1981. We, my, myself, K Mitchell, Keith, and Fred, we went to Howard Johnson's and sat down and decided that we would form a group. Now we didn't have a name yet, but as Fred and Mitchell were in the car talking, they were talking about some of their experiences and they started talking about, man, it's like we commissioned to do this. And Mitchell said, man, that sounds like a good name. He was like, what? And what name? He said, commissioned. So when they came to Howard Johnson's and sat down with Keith and I, we talked and they told us about the name and we thought about it. We said, yeah, commission sounds good. We'll, let's call ourselves commissioned. So um, the seven original members were uh, Fred, myself, Keith, Mitchell, Michael Williams, Michael Brooks, and the guitarist, Michael Wright. But you guys know him as Mike E because he put out music and did that. So um, that is how we came up with the name. And, um, I mean, we started doing what we were doing, man. We, um, we basically didn't have anyone that we could look to to say, we want to be like them because we wanted to be a self-contained band. We wanted to sing and do things like a lot of different singers. I mean, Stevie Wonder, uh, Donnie Hathaway, you know, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, the Ohio Players, 
um, we listened to the style. One of my favorite groups was the Stylistics, you know, mm -hmm. because of the falsetto singing. Um, and so we listened to different genres. My older brother was in a rock and roll band and they would play rock and roll music in the basement. And I was just standing, I would stand on the, on the landing and just listen, you know, to the rock and roll music. And so um, I, I think all of us have a history of, of loving music mm -hmm. and we did music in junior high and high school. And I believe that the, what God did was, was organically bring commission together. You know, but the nucleus of it was um, Keith Staten, myself, Mitchell Jones, and then Fred and the rest of the guys were added on. And Fred was the link between the the, 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 the band and commission. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that all came together in 1981. And uh, it took us four years to get an album finished and Light Records uh, picked us up. Now, they picked us up because the old manager of the Winans, we asked him before, would he manage us? And he said, no, I'm, I'm managing the Winans. And uh, when he lost his job, he, I think he made a personal vendetta to say, I'm going to show them Winans, guys. And so he got us a record deal, which is a lease agreement with Light Records. And uh, the album was finished and it came out. And then uh, I remember working uh, at Kmart headquarters and uh, showing everybody, yeah, I'm, 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 I got this album coming out, and yada, yada, <laughs> whatever, whatever. And uh, um, the album came out in July, right? Like the uh, second week in July. I mean, I remember like it was yesterday. And then we've heard uh, the first single, which is I'm Going On on the Radio. Well, I quit my job then. <laughs> 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 so, uh, 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 but then I had to get another job. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta pay for the car and the petrol. Right. <laughs> yeah, how you live? Yeah. Right. You gotta eat, go out, whatever. That's so, right. um, it took a while, but once that we finished the album in '84 and it hit in '85, um, I quit my job uh, for real, probably in '85, and I've not done anything other than uh, go to school for a minister. And then started ministering, man, probably about, oh, God, 20 years ago, 20 some odd years. I mean, 20, 25 years ago or so, started traveling, doing ministry stuff. So, um, but I, that's, that's all I've done is ministry and commission. So music slash ministry. That's, that's been over, oh, it's close to 40 years now. Um, yeah. Actually, my, my, my pulpit ministry spans over uh, 42 years. Wow. And um, yeah, that's kind of, kind of like telling about how old I am. So uh, it's been a while. <laughs> I I know, but <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> right, right. So, so you, I mean, you guys have. Um, I've we were, I think over here we saw a, a, an advert that you guys were getting back together, and everybody just got crazy over here. And, um, you know, the, the next thing is, oh, are they coming to the UK? Are they coming to the UK? Is it yeah. a reunion? Um, we saw adverts of you guys doing shows up and down, um, and all the original members. How, how, how's, how was that? How, how was that? How's that been? Well, you know, it, um, um, the, the coming back together and bringing back the original members has been, um, it's something that took a little work. You know, one of the things that myself and Mitchell Jones did was we kept the name Commission alive. And uh, yeah. uh, when we eventually decided to, uh, after uh, uh, 2004, everybody took like a little hiatus. But in uh, 10 years later or more, we started pulling back Keith State, right? And we had Marcus Cole with us. And so yeah. we decided, I decided to do a live video of Commission RSVP. And that was in 2016. So we went and sat down at a church and filmed it. You know, uh, I spent, spent $300 for a good friend of mine. He's, he filmed it for us. <laughs> um, and then the last moment, we called in Michael Brooks because our, the pianist backed out. So somebody said, why don't we call Michael Brooks, see if he'll do it. And he's like, well, yeah, I'll do it. So we had myself, Keith Staten, Mitchell Jones, Michael Brooks, and uh, Marcus Cole. And... Uh, the person that played guitar for us was uh, Daryl Dixon. Which okay. is, he's, he's deceased now. 
And we did a few songs and we put a, together like a collage of like five separate videos. And uh, once a week we released those. And once we started releasing those videos and Fred knew about it and the other guys knew about it, you know, it started, it started creating such a buzz in the industry. And the next thing you know, guys started talking. And the next thing you know, um, it's like, we need to come together, man, and do a commission reunion. And it really, it really kind of came together in like 2017 when Michael Brooks had a birthday celebration, a ministry celebration, and being in the music industry celebration. And so he asked us all to come. And uh, myself, Mitchell, um, Keith Staten, and Marcus Cole, we was, we was starting to do some traveling dates. And when we came there, Fred surprised us and came. <laughs> and it was like, then Marvin Sapp came to that. And then Michael Wright came. And so you've got all the original guys on stage plus uh, uh, Marvin Sapp. And so that sort of solidified it. And you can see that video on YouTube where we all were there together. That was at Michael Brooks' celebration for his, for his pastoring. And so from that point on in 2017, we just started moving towards um, traveling. And it didn't come to, to fruition until uh, 2000, uh, late 2018. And we actually traveled uh, last year in the month of no October, November. And we were scheduled to, to, to travel together, together again in April. Uh, Kurt Franklin and, um, and Fred Hammond did Versus. Now, the world saw it as a competition. I saw it as just, I saw it as surg doctors, surgeons at work on a, uh -huh. on a serious piece of, you know, on a serious part of the body, you know, yeah. of the heart. Um, how did you feel? I, I don't know if you saw it or had, how did you feel when you saw that? Um, um, well, I knew about it or I knew about it early and I'd, uh, I had said, I'm gonna watch it, you know, make sure I make sure I'm watching it. And, um, um, it was nothing like the verses that came before it because, um, they, they came from a ministerial aspect. They wanted to bring healing to the listeners. And there was, you know, I didn't, that was not a moniker of, of, of competition at all. It was songs that people had grew up on that ministered to them. And if you were watching, the thing that was so amazing to me was all of the movie stars and all of the actors and yes. all of, all of the, 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 the models, and all of the music people. Snoop Dogg was listening. Yeah. Amarian was listening. You got Tyrese. And you yeah. got Gabrielle Union. You got, oh, you got people just... And they're enjoying the gospel music, mm. right? And so the thing that I take away from it is, is that when you do what God tells you to do musically, you never know who's listening. And that is to say, you never know who you're ministering to. So you just do what you're supposed to do, make it the best you can make it. And you allow that to do what it's supposed to do. And I, I think that the, the time of healing, even the conversation with the, the, the mother, the young man who was, who was killed while jogging, yeah. um, she called in and it was, an, it was an opportunity for them to say that we're gonna pray for her and we need to have healing. Um, I thought it was timely. I thought it was professionally done. I thought, and there were parts of it that made Kurt and Fred and made, they showed how real gospel folks are. Yes. You know, we're married. Yeah. We, we, we don't lust after, because you can't lust after something that's yours, mm. but we desire our wives. And, mm. you know, so I know the idea, that there are certain ideas that people have about church folks. Like everything is so, so stern and it's like styrofoam. Well, that's not true, you know? And so I think first of all, it was healing. I think it was timely. And, and I think it gave an opportunity for people to walk down memory lane. Some of those songs when they were listening to, man, they're almost 40 years old. Yeah. So um, it brought back memories and it introduced people to uh, commissioned, introduced people to Kurt's song. And when I look at it, I'm like, 
I never looked at it and said, who's going to win? I, I looked at it to see, man, this is this is really good. It's, it's healing for people to hear this. It's it, 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 it occupied your mind and took your mind off of all of the trouble, the pandemic, and now uh, this craziness with the, with the rioting and looting. It took your mind off of that. And they spoke to, they spoke from a place of ministry to people who needed to be healed. And so I think it was excellent that they did it at that time. And, and it was really good for the people who were listening to it. And they got ministered to. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, I think that that's uh, uh, time for us, but I, I really appreciate your time, um, Mr. Reed. Uh, yes, sir. Joining us. It's been educational. It's been, it's been a great journey. And, um, and uh, we look forward to, well, we pray that you guys get back and, and come over to the UK. Right. Yeah, work something what? out. We'll speak to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> get y'all down here. Well, you know. <laughs> Uh, usually I wait for folks to invite me to dinner before I go show up. So. Oh, you know us now, so you can just turn up at the door. Uh -huh. I think it's an hour to cook, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, what uh, what we're doing, we're waiting on things to open back up here. We're praying that um, uh, we get back to normal, you know, where people can travel. We're not dealing with disease. You know, the word uh, disease is dis-ease. Mm. And we're dealing with it, um, you know, and, and I believe that God is going to give us uh, the second chance to start doing some stuff, man. Commission needs to come to uh, the UK again. We haven't been, my goodness, as, as the originals, we haven't been since the, um, the 90s. Yeah. And uh, I, I know I would love to go back, man. I, I, I hope that, you know, the food is diff different than what it was when we were there before. <laughs> um, we had to search all over town to uh to have something that we could eat but i'm gonna tell you something i had the best jerk chicken i've ever had mm -hmm. in a little small restaurant in birmingham okay oh man listen i i i think i ate my chicken before i got back to the hotel <laughs> <laughs> Well, that could be easily arranged. We can get someone to, to cook you up some, some food. Um, oh, man, you guys, listen. You have to come. Yeah, so we're, we're looking forward to uh, maybe working on something, man, and just um, just for all the folks in the UK to understand that we're, we're, right, in the, we're right at the point where we're going to start filming uh, the commission movie. And uh, we look forward to having something done by the end of the year because this, this pandemic and stuff is really putting a damper on stuff, but we're looking forward to having our release, the commission movie, um, next year. Looking forward and, to that. Uh, that'll 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 tell a story of the of how we did, what we did, why we did, when we did, where we did, all of that stuff. That's gonna that's gonna be. We start shooting hopefully sometime toward the end of the summer, and uh, I think it's gonna be great. I can't give any more details yet. Please. But, Please come back to us when once it's released and uh, oh yeah, talk about it. Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna come back. We're gonna come back to London, man, and and hopefully we can do uh, Manchester. We can do Birmingham, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the last place we did, I think, was the Hackney Theatre. Are they still open? Hackney Empire, yeah, that's still around. Yeah, it's yeah. still around. Okay, yeah. and then we did Wilmington too, right? We did Wilmington. Okay, um, Wilmington, yeah. Okay, we did them too. So. Hopefully we'll get back pretty soon, man, and see how you guys are living, man. We haven't seen you guys in over 20 years. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to it. We definitely are. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. All right, uh, this God morning. bless you. Bless you. Thank you for having me, Giant Killer. <laughs> God bless, bless you, man. Bless All you. right.